Welcome to the University of Manitoba Alumni and Friends Virtual Learning for Life Series 20, Fall 2020 Series. My name is Tracy Bowman. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations here at the University of Manitoba and also a very proud UM alumna, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Thank you for joining us and making this part of your day. We've been able to offer this program free or complimentary to all of our alumni, our 148,000 alumni living in 140 countries around the world, thanks to the very generous sponsorship of one of our affinity partners, IA Financial Group. Many thanks to them for their support. Delivering learning for life opportunities is very important for the University of Manitoba, and we're very proud that we're able to feature so many of our leading researchers and professors in this way. So just a few housekeeping details before I introduce today's speaker. And that is, as you know, as per usual, today's session is recorded and we will share a link with you afterwards if you'd like to look at it again, as well as we'll be sharing a survey uh, with you to gather your feedback. Again, as usual, we use the platform called Slido. That's www.sli.do. And we use the, we'll be using the password VL02. So we encourage you to use that platform to ask questions. And I will be monitoring that platform and then asking your questions to our speaker on your behalf. Please feel free to ask questions throughout. I will be checking it. Uh, ask follow-up questions if perhaps I've misrepresented a question. Please do add uh, additional points, comments, questions. We're, we're open to all of that. And we'll try to get through as many as we can at the end of the presentation. So now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. J. Ann English. She will be presenting on the topic of Cosmos and Canvas, using art to reveal science in astronomy public outreach images. And let me tell you a little bit about her uh, before she gets going. She's an associate professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, she uses space-based and radio telescopes to help trace elusive dark matter to investigate how galaxies form radio halos, as well as develop peculiar shapes while gravitationally inter interacting. Her forte is in producing striking astronomy outreach images that appear in prestigious magazines and popular and educational books and numerous websites. She's also, this is very interesting, she's coordinated NASA's Hubble Heritage Project's first two years of image production. And she very recently uh, was the recipient of the second of second place in the prestigious National Radio Astronomy Ob Observatory, Observatory Image Contest. So with that, over to you, Dr. English. Thank you very much. And here we go. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to talk. Uh, today's uh, presentation is called Cosmos and Canvas. Uh, I do a variety of these. And this one today is using art to reveal science and astronomy public outreach images. So people, when they look at the public outreach images, they want to know if they are fanciful spacescapes, something that's manipulated and cut and paste, or if they were something that we would see with our eyes if we could put our eye to the eyepiece of the Hubble Space Telescope. Of course, we can't put our eye to the eyepiece of the, public space, of the Hubble Space Telescope, but if we could, is this what we would see? Now, public outreach, these images that are made for public outreach, public outreach happens to be informal education. And professional astronomers have been encouraged by the International Astronomical Union to communicate more effectively with the public. And the reason for this is because it has a lot of impact. There is about 2 million people out of 34 million in Canada during the International Year of Astronomy that said they actually looked through a telescope or went to a planetarium or did some astronomy activity. That's just the tip of the iceberg. So we know we're getting uh, a lot of interest from people. And indeed, I hear at the moment that a telescope is hard to come by. People are so interested during COVID-19 to do some astronomy. Some of our impact is, uh, for things like the Hubble Space Telescope, a NASA director said there would be no servicing missions. 
And there was a huge public outcry about this and he actually lost his job and the servicing missions were reinstated. And the huge public outcry is because of public outreach. And part of this is because of the images that we produced with the Hubble Space Telescope. We refer to the Hubble as HST often. And of course you can see these HST images on everything from clothing to backpacks. So it's permeating our culture. Now the public outreach images back in the day were made for uh, textbooks, newspapers, magazines, but now they're all over the web. There's lots of image databases, sky maps, video podcasts, and so on. So the intention though of these public outreach images is not to tell you everything about an object. Here's something we wrote for the Hubble Heritage Project. By emphasizing compelling HST images distilled from scientific data, we hope to pique the curiosity about our astrophysical understanding of the universe we all inhabit. So instead of telling you everything about an object in one image, what we're actually trying to do is build bridges between astronomers and society and to pique the interest of the public. We hope that after your interest is piqued that you would go and look at all these various websites and find out more about the uh, astronomical object of interest. So how, well, let's start with who makes these images. Back in the day, there were people who were photographers that were hired to make the images for textbooks and magazines. Here's David Malin at the Anglo-Australian Telescope and he used film photography and he was given time by the director of the observatory in order to make the images. These days they're made in teams. So here's the Hubble Heritage team. I'm the exceedingly short one over towards the right. And you can see that the team is exceedingly large uh, these images aren't made by one person. And what we would do is appropriate the scientific data and create images out of that. Also, another way of making it is you are a scientist, you're working with scientists to um, measure and find out things about the universe. And as you do that, in this case with a radio telescope, here I am with some of my colleagues, you're asked to produce images for public outreach by your fellow um, co-authors. So this is a Canadian telescope here. It's the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory, affectionately known as DREO. So we'll come across that again. Here is one of the images that really inspired the creation of public outreach images by many observatories. It's the pillars of creation, it's molecular clouds where uh, whole solar systems are forming. So our, is an image like that one or the image like the one on the left here, are these outreach images snapshots? Now the public would like that they are snapshots, um, the images are in the Western image tradition of representation, which means they look very realistic. They're detailed, they're naturalistic, they mimic nature, they're convincing, they're compelling. Another thing they do is appear to preserve the form of things as they occur in the world. And they're used as a proof of an entity, effect, or event. This has uh, data from three telescopes in it. And what it is showing you is galaxies. So here's a galaxy and here's some really messed up galaxies. And it's showing you that they're consisting of stars. And then this pink glow is uh, gas and the orangish stuff can be dust. And because of the gravitational attraction, there's these distortions that lets us know that there's dark matter. Um, and we can also do computer simulations to then reproduce this kind of configuration of galaxies. We know that these galaxies are interacting. They'll eventually merge together to form one larger galaxy. When you make measurements out of our data, the stars we find have been forming for only about 10 million years, but the universe is 13 and a half billion years old. So uh, we call this a pristine fossil group. It's only starting to interact and merge together right now. So it's kind of like arrested development for galaxies, but this lets us know how galaxies have been forming in the past. 
Now this image representation is constructed out of data and data comes from a totally different tradition. Scientific data belongs to the logic tradition of images, which uh, can be defined this way, counting rather than picturing machines. So for a picturing machine, it would be like a film camera. A counting machine aggregates masses of data to make statistical arguments for the existence of a particle or an effect. Now, if you look at the Hubble Space Telescope or indeed any detector, even a radio telescope, we have a, a counting machine. So in your cell phone, you have a charge coupled device or CCD camera, and you know about pixels. And each of the pixels counts up the number of photons that land in that pixel. So we're counting up the number of photons and we're spreading it across with the each, there's many pixels across the surface. We also collect, as you can see in the top left-hand corner, many data sets and we combine those so that we get a strong signal that's much higher than all the fluctuations and noise in an image. So we're doing statistics here. And when we do our analysis, we're mathematically subtracting and adding and doing all sorts of things to our data. A really good example is radio telescope, like this one on the right, the Australia Telescope Compact Array. And what happens is if I point at a target with these antennas, the Earth rotates, and as it rotates, these tennis, antennas form a circle and they synthesize a mirror. So in the logic tradition, eventually in the logic tradition, pictures become surfaces on which quantitative information was deposited. So here I have an example of how the mirror is synthesized over time. And at first you can see there's no image at all. We're gonna see circles that are artifacts here due to bright objects and the rotation of the earth. But over time, the measurements have been laid down and we can see in the center something that's called a supernova remnant. I'll talk about that in a moment. So as a scientist, remember I'm talking about uh, scientists creating these images. As a scientist, the culture of science is going to have a very strong impact. If the science is clear, as in a contour plot like this, then the astronomer feels the image is incredibly appealing. Like you can see all of the places where stars are forming, indeed they're even labeled, but the public doesn't find these images intriguing at all. So what we do is we use techniques from visual art and design to create appealing versions. So here's the same target here with the Hubble Space Telescope imagery, and it's not a contour plot. Let me take you through this really quickly about how this went historically. We had David Malin, that was the guy who was sitting in the telescope, who was making film pictures of something like the Crab Nebula. Now the Crab Nebula is a supernova remnant. That means that a massive star exploded in the outer parts of the star here is all that filamentary structure in the center is left the core of the star and it's incredibly densely packed. So we call it a neutron star and it has these beams of radiation coming out from the core of that star. And if the star is rotating in a way where the beams face us, we get these pulses. So we will call that star not only a neutron star, but also a pulsar. Okay, so here we have a supernova remnant, the outer layers of the star on this filamentary structure. And we can see that it's pink and that's because there's hydrogen there. And this image, if your eyes were as sensitive as photographic film, this is the color you would see for this supernova remnant. So if you ever wanna know what the color of an object is, try to see if David Malin has done it for the Anglo-Australian Observatory. But your eyes aren't very sensitive detectors. Another way of having public outreach images disseminated is just to take those contour plots from a scientist and put them into the public. Again, that's happening now. So here's Hubble Space Telescope data that's been made into an image by a scientist and for him, he goes on about, see how the faint blue glass gas seems to envelop other colors. And it gets really very complicated what he's trying to describe and we all get lost. But for him, the scientific meaning is much more important than the aesthetic. And he's trying to tell you about the density of the gas and the temperature of the gas and the chemical composition of the gas. Well, you can do exactly the same thing 
Uh, in this image here, we've zoomed into the heart of the Crab Nebula. The pulsar is right here. And we can see all the filamentary structure and the color coding tells us the temperature and chemical composition of the gas. So we retain the scientific information, but this aesthetic, it's now much more detailed. It's much more in the image, the Western image tradition, and the aesthetic is as important as the content. So how do we go from the logic tradition images to the uh, Western image tradition images? Well, I'm going to take you through that. First of all, we have to start with the electromagnetic spectrum. And here we see on the uh, left hand side, we have high energy like gamma rays. And on the right hand side, we have low energy like radio waves. Now we're looking at light as if it's in a wave. And right in the center here, the visible light, it's a very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So when we're looking at it in terms of waves, we can look at the distance between the peaks and they're very short at high energy and they're very long distances between the peaks at low energy. And we call the distance between the peak, the wavelength. So now we have this little arrow showing us the wavelength. And I'm gonna talk a lot about wavelengths. We want to use our detector to capture all of the energy we can. So we don't use any of it to encode color information. Instead, what we do is we stick a filter in between the camera and the light that's coming in. So on the bottom here, you can see all of the wavelengths going into this filter, piece of glass, and coming out is only one energy range of wavelengths here. And if you look at images taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, you'll see in a range where our eye does not see in the ultraviolet, we have filters that produce different images then when we look uh, at filters that are in the infrared, again, we don't see this with our eyes. And you can see the distribution of light is different. And in the middle here, we have the visible light. And we've only filtered teeny tiny little ranges here for the visible light. So your eye sees all of this, but the telescope doesn't see any of it, and except for these little regions, and it sees outside the range of visible light. And we put, select these particular filters because they will tell us what the star's ages are, what their chemical elements are, and so on. So we don't make it to match our eyes because we want to figure out physical characteristics of this galaxy. We have to now take the black and white data and uh, we want to then assign colors to the black and white data and combine them and then we'll get an image like this that shows us old stars are in the center of the galaxy, young stars and hot gas and dust are in a ring around that center. How do we uh, colorize the images? Here's an example in this little video. I have three black and white images and the one that's in the infrared, I'm gonna color red. Uh, this is using GIMP, you can use Photoshop. The one that's visible light, I'm going to color green. And the one that's the uh, ultraviolet light, I'm gonna color blue. And that's the start of making a colored image for Hubble Space Telescope. Now the Hubble Space Telescope uses these sorts of filters. They tell you, uh, this tells you how, if, how much light the filter is letting through when it's up high like this and it's dropped off, not much light is coming in down here. And down here are the distances between the peaks in the wave. We use nanometers, and here we're going from about 450 nanometers all the way out to about 700 nanometers for this black curve right here. And what I want you to now see is what the human eye sees. Uh, there's this rectangle, which is all the theoretical color space all the colors that could potentially ever be. And what humans see after doing a lot of experiments are just these colors in here. And along this edge here, you can see numbers, and these are the nanometers associated with the color. And what I want you to notice here are two things. One, uh, hydrogen is gonna be in this red range at 600, we're at 600 to 700 nanometers. Oxygen is gonna be at uh, 500 nanometers, so it's green, 
and the ultraviolet is over here in the blues at 400 nanometers. But if we go from about 440 nanometers all the way up to about 700 nanometers, we get one black and white image that covers all of the colors that the human eye sees. So we have to choose what color we're gonna to assign to it because it could be any of these colors. Now, in this example of a nebula, we have got six filtered images and here's one in the ultraviolet and here's one in the infrared and here's one in that filter that covers all of the colors we see. The middle range is around 500 nanometers. So we could say, let's color that one green. And because blue is a uh, high energy for visible light as well, we'll color the ultraviolet blue and low energy will color it red. Now we have three more filters here and they're very narrow filters covering small ranges. Here's um, 502 oxygen and here's hydrogen at the 600s, but there's another one at the 600s, sulfur. And look how different the structure is for sulfur and hydrogen. And if you colored them both red, you'd lose that information. So we don't wanna do that. But I already showed you uh, how we did the uh, made this image on the bottom right, and we now have our question about what do we do to color the other three narrow filters. Well, we're not going to do it arbitrarily, but we're going to use techniques from visual art and design. We're going to use visual grammar. Visual grammar includes the techniques of composition and color harmony, and the effect is to create spatial depth, richness and color in detail and communicate sometimes without the need of a legend because editors are gonna strip that information off and the image will have to stand on its own. I'm just gonna show you one example from uh, visual grammar. So if you want to know more, just Google Cosmos Canvas JM portfolio, portfolio, and you'll come across a website that has video tutorials and a lecture that goes into the composition and uh, color assignments in a bit more detail. There's a very detailed article and so on. I wanna to prove to you that color is incredibly important. So I'm gonna ask you to do this exercise. I want you to stare, if, without blinking if possible, at this yellow circle for 15 seconds and I'll count down. And then you're gonna look at this uh, ring on the left hand side and you're gonna tell me what color, well, uh, we're online, you can't tell me what color you see, I'll have to tell you. Okay, here we go. Stare at the yellow circle. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, nine and a three quarters thousand, 10,000, 11,000, 12,000, 13,000, 14,000, 15,000. Look at that ring on the left and you will see a bluey purple or purpley blue. Okay, that's the complementary color. Your eye brain system produces that. No one came over and painted it. So when we're making images, we can work with our physiology and use complementary colors to make an image that people will be engaged with. An easy way to, uh, or tool that's easy to use to determine complementary colors uh, is the color wheel. On the left-hand side, if you're using computers and light, you will have uh, three primary colors. As you saw, if we stared at yellow, we got a purpley blue. We call it blue, but really it's this blue-violet color. Same for the red, it's an orange-red color. If you stare at red and you'll see cyan or vice versa to get the compliments. Now, uh, there's also up here a term that I'm saying we're making harmonious compositions. You will notice that if you add uh, green and magenta together, you will get white. And that's a technical term, harmonious. It means that you will add together to a nice pure white if you've done this correctly. It doesn't mean it's a complement 
uh, as in flattery. Instead, it's a technical term. Uh, so you can also split the complement, which means you could take green and go equal distance from the magenta on the color wheel to the red and to the blue. And when you do that and you add green, red, and blue together, you will also get white. So you can split the complement to make a harmonious image. So these are things we keep in mind when we're making our images. I just want to show you one example from composition and visual grammar. These two circles are exactly the same size, but one of them is going to appear larger or pop towards you for about 80% of the population. And that's the red one. So artists call anything that pops forward warm and anything that goes back cool. Oh uh, yes, that's different than the scientists who call blue hot and red cool. So keep that in mind. I might switch into art speak and talk about warm and cool for warm things coming forward. And this tells us about how we could color these three filters. Green is gonna be cooler than magenta. It's gonna go back so we can color it that way. And we won't use the two reds together here because then we lose this different structure from the two different elements. And instead we create an image that looks like this. And the green is uh, sitting closer. Instead of coloring this all magenta here, we've colored it green, which is cooler, which means if you look at this image for quite a while, the star cluster here is going to sit forward of this cooler color. And you'll notice that it's green and pink or green and magenta, and those are complementary colors, so they keep you engaged in the image. Okay, we're using a lot of art technique here. You might ask, well, how much are you manipulating them? Not really. <laughs> we're using techniques from old film photography. And uh, when you look at a group of galaxies like this, it's not a montage if it's coming from the Hubble Space Telescope. You can be assured that these are distorted galaxies that live in this little group. So I wanna do a really quick uh, recap here before I move on. Be suspicious of statements like Hubble snaps images of or this true color Hubble Space Telescope images because you've just learned that it's not a snapshot. It takes time. You collect the photons. You use multiple data sets. Uh, usually there is a non-optical filter like infrared or ultraviolet and the image is not what your eye would see if you put your eye to the Hubble Space Telescope eyepiece. You might be curious now about what you would see. So here's a planetary nebula. I'll talk a bit about these kind of objects in a little while. This planetary nebula is in a globular cluster and the globular cluster has a, a million stars in it. Glob of stars. Uh, if you put your eye to the eyepiece of the Hubble, it doesn't have one, but if you could, then your eye is not very sensitive to color when things are faint. You're not getting any photons. And it could at best look greenish to you. And remember I said green was at 500 nanometers and that's going to be oxygen. So you would think that this planetary nebula has a lot of oxygen, but we can do something called spectroscopy and actually measure the amounts of chemicals. And when we do that, it's hydrogen that dominates. And so we color our image to show you that there's hydrogen here. And we get another truth out of coloring it like this. Now you can see that there are oranges stars and there are bluish stars. And so we get hot stars, cool stars, and hydrogen in this image. So we, when we make our images, are true to the physical phenomena and not to the uh, insensitivity of your eyes. I like to use radio and infrared data because then you don't have to be true to any color because they don't have any color. I would just like to quickly say here, and you can uh, look at another lecture by me online if you like, that these images have been examined to see if they are artworks. They're exceedingly striking, but that does not make them artworks. And uh, a couple of people have noticed, of course, that they're, are a lot of people and different softwares being used to create the images unlike what's done by an individual artist. But the most compelling argument that says that they are not art is that there's no formal connection. 
to concerns in contemporary painting and photography. What we are actually doing here is illustrating science. And that might not be so important if you just want to collect together some very striking images that it's not art. Um, what we try to do is make image tradition representations that resonate with the scientific content in complex logic tradition data images. So let me go through a bit of the science here. In this image from the Hubble, you can see the orbits of stars have created an X shape. All the pink here is when, where young stars are heating up gas. This galaxy looks a bit noisy, doesn't it? Well, that's because there's piles of globular clusters around it. All those little dots are globular clusters. In this one, in this radio and infrared image, we have star death and star birth. So these yellow and red circular features are supernova remnants. The white little blobs here are clouds where stars are forming. Uh, and we have uh, in, in these supernova remnants, we have something that's called synchrotron radiation. And what happens there is charged particles move in the magnetic field lines and the mag they spiral around magnetic field lines. And when they accelerate in that circle, they give off uh, photons of light. So that I want you to remember synchrotron radiation. Uh, the rest of this stuff here is all thermal, like it's heated gas and dust. And these little dots here, because it's not visible light, these are not stars. These also have synchrotron radiation, and that's coming from the jets out of black holes. So those are showing us where the supermassive black holes are in the center of galaxies. So there's a lot of scientific content in this image. Uh, here's another radio image and um, supernova remnants, star forming regions, but we've got this green mess here, this ugly green mess. Well, that's synchrotron radiation. It's showing us that the Milky Way has a magnetic field. This is the same region actually that's, oops, let me go back here, uh, right over here on the right. And uh, that is here in cold hydrogen gas. And for cold hydrogen gas, we can do the Doppler shift, which is meow, and then color code according to the Doppler shift. Eh, comes towards you, all oh, is when it's going away. We've colored that eh, blue, it's over here. All oh, it's warmer, uh, but duller colors. And that's, um, uh, going away and blue is coming towards you. Sorry if I, I misspoke, the blue is coming towards you and you can see the rotation of our Milky Way galaxy along with heated dust and cold gas. Now, public outreach images aren't uh, amazing to the scientists who made them, did not just stay in the public but got absorbed into our professional journals. Here we see Oh, what a professional astronomer would produce. We see this galaxy. We think it has a huge synchrotron radio halo. We would do it in these little contour plots like this to try and analyze it. This takes a lot of time to discern, but we can make it more uh, quick to understand for the public by producing an explanatory image. We take um, optical data and that gives us the galaxy disk. Then we take the radio data, and what we discover is that behind this optical disk is a background galaxy with a black hole with jets much, much further away than the disk is. It's just a coincidence that the uh, synchrotron radiation from this background black hole is uh, perpendicular to this disk. Nature pulls a fast one. And combining those together, we get the image on the left, and that gives us um, a cover on a professional journal. So it's even clo uh, very clear to the astronomers. Okay, I want to tell you about one more technique that you'll be seeing in the images, and it's masking. So you take two different stretches. You've probably seen this on the phone that you can stretch to different, uh, intensities when you have a CCD image. Here we see a beautiful textured ring in a planetary nebula, but you don't see the outer regions. And if you stretch it, you can see these faint outer regions. Now, if you put your hand up 
to mask out the light of the sun when an airplane comes by, you can see the airplane better. So what we're gonna do here is create a mask and block out the light from the ring in this stretch of the image and combine them together. And that gives us an image with more physical characteristics shown. A planetary nebula is what our own sun is going to become. It's going to just kind of hiccup off its outer layers and uh, then leave the core of the star. And so this is maybe a configuration our sun will become. This is one I really love and masking has been used for this one. It's also a planetary nebula. So where do we go from here? Well, we have a lot of frontier observatories, one in space, a lot on the ground, radio ones. It's just amazing what's happening. So we start to combine data from different telescopes now using the masking technique. This is a supernova remnant and the pulsar that was in the center of it, well, when the explosion happened, it was asymmetric and it got kicked out and the pulsar is right at the tip here. This is the trail of the pulsar and it's right there. This again is not invisible in optical light, but in two to, using two different radio telescopes. Now we can take also data from a bunch of galaxies and put them together. And again, this is synchrotron emission. This is, we've put together 30 galaxies here to, to show you what the halo looks like typically and masked in an image I made of a Hubble Space Telescope data of a representative galaxy disk. Uh, the newest things we're doing is we're converting vectors into filaments using an algorithm called line integral convolution. So what this shows us here is the direction of the magnetic field lines that those electrons are spiraling in to create that synchrotron emission. This is what the uh, scientist produces, but I want you to watch how you can join together these vectors and then mask in a Hubble Space Telescope disk and you get all these filaments instead, which is a very engaging image of it. And it was mentioned that I won uh, recently a second prize and it was for this image here of the magnetic field lines coming out of the Hubble Space Telescope image I created of this galaxy that we see edge on. Where are we going for outreach images? We're starting to use um, 3D virtual reality, reality like the Vive headset. We're doing, we did some of this at the University of Manitoba. And also we're doing it at Cape, we collaborate with people in Cape Town University. Now, people are also making Western image tradition images, representations of computer simulations. That's because gravitational waves we're going to move now to an era of gravitational waves, not just electromagnetic waves. They don't have images, but you can make images from the computer simulations of what's going on. This is not a photograph of two black holes merging. It's an image made from a computer simulation, so be careful. I wanna move into different audiences, not just those that are already interested in astronomy, so I work with composers and artists. And so here's something I've done. And I've worked with, a, oh, I should say that Nikki Lise um, actually is a Governor General award-winning composer. So it's nice to be targeting another audience. And the videos that we made go in the background uh, of when a live ensemble is playing. Then I worked with this artist. We didn't display them except online, but she wanted to use no color, but she draws. So she wants to use markers instead of candy colored schemes and have scientific credibility. So instead of coloring each filtered image, she made marks for each. This is just a very preliminary experiment and did this planetary nebula here. And you can actually see a lot of things in this and it's not in a, a very realistic tradition. So I just wanna do a quick recap. I hope I haven't gone too far over my time, but the culture of science has a strong impact and we do combinations of logic tradition data images using scientific data that's produced by scientists. So the public outreach images are an attempt to represent the science and not what the eye would see. And we assign color to retain some of the scientific meaning or physical information. So if you strip off the legend, you still can read the image. 
But color could be used to emphasize an experience if you are a um, citizen science or an artist. Uh, you can provide insight to your research for your fellow scientists. This happens all the time with the public outreach images, and that's why they get into the journals. You can use it to describe the pleasure of doing astronomy without any constraints. Uh, we use visual grammar from art to, in order to produce uh, image tradition representations because they pique the interest of the public and then they can go and find out more about these work, these objects. But these very striking images don't need to be considered artworks to be valued. They're limited in their manipulation, similar to the way film photography is constrained. That's if you're a research astronomer. But if you are watching me and you're a citizen scientist, don't feel constrained at all. Okay, that's it. I just want to say that in the battle between the culture of science and the culture of art, if you look at it as a struggle to balance these two things, when you make a public outreach image, uh, both sides win. Taking the same data here, you can see other renditions. So there's no one right way to make it and feel free to go and make your own images. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. English. That was really fascinating and also beautiful images. And it's just amazing what you're able to produce and it's all in the sky. It's just, it's very neat. So uh, we've had a question come in. I actually was on the, I, I went to the NASA website as you were speaking to learn a little bit more about um, the Hubble uh, telescope and realized that it's also, 2020 is the 30th anniversary that the Hubble <laughs> Hope has yep. been in orbit, which is amazing. Yep. And yep. I didn't realize it was that long. So we've done, uh, there's a lot that we've learned, I'm sure, in the last yeah. years. So I've, I've got some of my own notes and some questions, but I encourage our audience, please do go to Slido and the password's VL02. Um, one of the questions we received, it didn't even occur to me, this is such a great question. And that is, I'm wondering how do you accommodate for colorblind audiences in right. these visualizations? Right. This is this is totally fascinating. Um, I I mean this my lecture keeps growing over the years. So if you go to the one that's on the Oxford website and when you find that link, it will describe to you seven different color contrasts. So if you're working in black and white, you only have light and dark contrasts. If you're working in color, you have seven <laughs> contrasts that you can use, and one of them is light dark. So uh, what we do, I, you might have noticed that uh, I, I didn't manage to show you anything about rotation curves and stuff like that. But instead of just using red and blue, we will use light red and dark blue or dark red and light blue so that the colorblind people can read those as well. And there's another one that's saturation as well. The problem for colorblind people is there's like a multitude of different types of colorblindness. So when they are testing your eyes, they actually use filters as well. And they use 300 filters. So that means it's incredibly, it, there's a, an incredible variety of uh, color blindness. It's impossible to compensate for that. I have had people, uh, I teach a course called the Art of Scientific Visualization, and we had someone in it who was colorblind. And what we all learned from this is not that we had to accommodate him, he had to accommodate us because <laughs> otherwise his, his images were totally unharmonious and we wouldn't look at them. And so that was the interesting thing that we learned. So we can do saturation and we can do light dark um, to uh, have a redundancy in our images that can help with color blindness. But if you're a colorblind image maker, you have to actually accommodate us as well. That's very interesting. Does that take into account also like layers and textures and because people, what people see in terms of depth also, depth per perception and those who have an astigmatism, for example, also see things differently too. Yeah, so we, so that's why very, that's why the Western image tradition representation is popular is because it's very detailed. So you get a lot, a lot of fine detailed structure and that's why people like Hubble Space Telescope images because they're very detailed. But we don't accommodate, uh, we, it's hard, it's really hard to accommodate everybody. And the, the other thing too is we don't even accommodate by making a standard color table. You'll find that um, amateur astronomer groups will call something the Hubble palette. 
And we <laughs> Hubble uh, research astronomers don't use the Hubble palette. <laughs> so we don't make a standard legend for things either. Every it's but one size does not fit all. Every cosmic object demands its own color legend and own approach. Okay, great. A few more questions have come through. And one, one is, um, you know, what software do you use to create these representations? Okay, so that's really good too. So for the, the stretches, remember I showed you the stretches of the planetary nebulae and one is uh, saturated with white and the other is got the nice textured ring. To get those really beautiful stretches, what we do is we use astronomy software. So the one I like is one that's uh, no longer functional. It's called the Karma Visualization Suite. It's no longer developed, it's functional. It works really well. And we're really reluctant to abandon it. And it was made in the 90s. Um, so some of the functionality is now being ported over to another astronomy software package called Carta. But you can do this in, photo in Photoshop and using an, uh, a plugin called FITS Liberator. And it will take, because astronomy data is in FITS format, it's a little technical detail here, but you can uh, use FITS Liberator and that can help you make a stretch. But um, if you're using a Mac or any Unix, Linux based machine, you can download uh, Karma and use that. Now, once you have your black and white stretches, you put them out into say PPMs or something, then you put them into something like Photoshop. I don't use Photoshop. I use the GNU image manipulation package because you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to pay a monthly fee. It works on any platform and I train a lot of people. So I can't be doing system administration and making people who might only use it for one workshop pay. So I just use the GNU image manipulation package. So go ahead, download that, put black and white images into it and go for it. You can make those layers like I showed and assign color to those uh, layers. I do have YouTube videos on how to do all that. And so where would we find those YouTube videos? Can you remind us again? Yeah, just Google me. You'll get to the uh, universe, my homepage, my old uh, retro homepage on U of M's websites. And then you just go to the link for um, my visualization pages. It tells you how to calibrate your monitor and then go to the YouTube videos. And there's a lecture. This is old. This is 2009. There's a more updated one on the Oxford website, but then after the lecture, there are all these very detailed, how to make the stretches, how to assign colors, why you do this, why you don't want to do that. Yeah. Okay, so great. There. Okay, good to know. I would encourage everybody to do that uh, for all of our citizen scientists out there. Um, another question is, can this method be used to present false theories about the universe? And how would the casual observer know? Okay, so, um, if we're doing it, so this is, again, remember I talked about editors stripping off the information, right? So in that case, yes, people, and <laughs> one of the first images we ever made for the Hubble heritage team was appropriated by an, a religious group. They're put out there for free right? We don't track them. We don't make you pay royalties. So anybody can use them for anything, which is, uh, can be disturbing. Um, can you, uh, but I want to go to the other end of the question here. Whenever anyone makes an illustration or takes a photograph, they're telling a story. They're not objective. It's not pure. They have a narrative. So all of the images that we make, we are presenting a narrative. So if I am telling you with an image from the Hubble and it's only Hubble data, I'm not telling you about the cold hydrogen gas that's there. I'm not telling you about um, the X-rays that are coming from binary X-ray, uh, binary stars that are emitting x-rays in that galaxy. I'm not telling you all these other things about the object. I have one illustration for one narrative. 
that I'm doing to make that clear. And that's why we're piquing your interest and then asking you to go and look at a lot of other information. So what happens when a Hubble Space Telescope image goes out there, all the information will be stripped off. If it's put in a magazine, it won't tell you people made this image. It will tell you that NASA made the image. It won't tell you what the goals were of the scientist. It won't tell you what decisions the image maker made. But if you then go to the Hubble Heritage website or to now, now the Heritage website is now gone. But if you go to um, Hubble site, it will tell you everything. What filters were used? What's the size on the sky? And who were the scientists? So for any of these images, you can go then and Google them and find out who made them and what they were trying to say. So we're not intentionally at all trying to present false theories. Other people can appropriate our stuff and present false theories. So it's your responsibility to go to the to the NASA website or the DREO website or uh, the National Radio Astronomical Observatory website and find out what is going on. And there's lots on the NASA website. Yeah. I was just looking just all that's on just just on the Hubble Space Telescope is, is amazing. Um, there's a blog that's called Illuminated Universe. And I'm working mm. on putting the um, one with the magnetic field lines coming out of the galaxy on Illuminated Universe. That's a very useful site um, where people are describing precisely how the images are made and talking about the science. Oh, great. Okay, good. Okay, more questions have come through. Um, one is more of a basic question is how do you spell Junu? Spell, pardon me? Do I, so I don't know if this is something maybe that you uh, a specific word you reference is it do new do do no is there something that you you, you said, said in your presentation that was on that it says d o n e w d o n e and they don't know how to spell it that's why they're asking <laughs> oh no I wish I could hear it um, yeah that, we can always come back to that if maybe maybe. Okay. If, if, they, if you can like tell me specifically what it was about, sure. it was an object or whether it was about color composition or something, that would be very helpful. Perfect, okay. So we'll, hopefully that person will, will, will do that. Uh, other questions that have come through, do you have a favorite source of data for your images? Uh, a favorite source of data for my images? Yeah. Um, uh, excellent question, uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, I I will say radio data is exceedingly rich. Um, so there's two answers to this question. So for me, for the frontier, it's going to be the, so we've been talking about the Hubble Space Telescope. That's not the premier telescope that we've produced. What is the most premier telescope now that most sci more scientists apply to use than to use the Hubble is called ALMA, the Atacama um, Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array. And it is an array of dishes. It's an international telescope built by countries all over the world. Uh, and it operates in the microwave regime, which is a whole new frontier. It's got as good resolution, as good detail, as the Hubble Space Telescope. So that is a favorite. Then there are the precursors for um, the next big international radio telescope, which is actually gonna be built in two places. And one place is in South Africa and one place is in Australia. And I didn't put it in um, because I had too much stuff already in, uh, in my talk, but we have just discovered a new kind of object. I was so excited when I, they discovered this new kind of object that I'm, I'm making images of it. And it's, we don't know what it is at all. We can eliminate a whole bunch of things, but we don't know what it is. And it's like these big circular synchrotron objects. We don't know whether they're in our galaxy. We don't know whether they're in other galaxies and humongous. We just don't know what they are. And so those are for my science and making frontier images, you know, uh, where no one has gone before. Those are the telescopes I like. Now, for public outreach, 
what kind of telescope do I like? Well, I like to have my object get disseminated very far in the world because I'm trying to reach you. So I will often put in a Hubble Space Telescope image that I've made, mask it in because then NASA will also put it on their website and it will go really far. And I love Hubble Space Telescope data. I worked on the Hubble Heritage team and when that director was talking about not servicing the Hubble Space Telescope, he told us to all stop being Hubble huggers. And I was so offended. And I went around telling everybody, I'm a Hubble hugger. I'm a Hubble hugger. I wanted to make stuffed Hubbles and hug them. But uh, so uh, it's very hard to say which is my favorite telescope. Long answer, sorry. <laughs> So with the previous question about the GNU, I think it seems to have resolved itself on Slido, and I think it's GNU. So G N U. I think GNU. it was the uh, GNU. GNU is um, uh, GNU is the name for um, a project that. Uh, so GIMP is uh, the GNU image manipulation package. And GNU is like an, a, a, an animal icon uh, that is used for people who devote their time for free and volunteer to build these softwares. Ah, okay. That's what GNU is. So yeah, you can look that up. It's a it's a open source uh, volunteer software development. Oh, excellent. There seems to be a few people in our audience who, who are aware of this and there's some conversation going. So that, oh, good. So that's great. Another question that came in, really interesting, have you used the data to create animated images? Uh, so <laughs> to make animated images is now quite easy. <laughs> so you do, uh, I mean, if you have a Mac, you just uh, can screen share and make a movie. So uh, what is it? It's control shift five and then you select it. <laughs> a movie so uh so you can yeah uh, to make the images themselves you can it depends what you wanted to show of course but my animation i just showed gimp <laughs> so you can you can do all sorts of different beautiful things with it and i can imagine you can use your imagination to make uh beautiful illustrations that tell a story about an object uh, a cosmology a cosmo cosmos object well, those are all the questions that have come through. So did you want to, before I do my conclusion, is there any sort of last comments that you wanted to share or are you, you've sourced a number of different places for us to go. Is there anything else that you would share or recommend in terms of if we wanted to learn more or, or create our own um, images as you've suggested? Um, no, so far, I think, I think the questions were great and they uh, spanned the range of uh, important issues and um, so I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Thank you for asking them. Super. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. English. That was very interesting. And by the questions, there's a lot of uh, very talented people in the audience who are also, you know, very much part of this and, and, and want to learn more. So, so thank you for that. Thank you to everybody for participating. So as I said earlier, we'll be sending you a link to this presentation so you're able to watch it again and again as many times as you'd like. Uh, we'll also be sending you a link to a survey. Please do fill it out so you can provide us with that very important feedback uh, so we're able to improve for, for future your sessions. Uh, and uh, it, just a reminder that uh, if you haven't registered yet, uh, next week we have two speakers. We've got Dr. Carla Taylor uh, and Dr. Peter uh, Zaradka on the topic of eating to live longer and better, which should be also uh, very interesting. So thank you everybody for tuning in for the last hour, for spending that time with us. Stay safe and we will see